Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for making the time to join us today. We want this to be an interactive time and hope you'll share with us. We just have a few housekeeping items for our session today. To preserve the audio quality, please make sure to keep all lines muted. Enter your questions into the chat panel and make sure everyone is selected as the recipient. I'll present the questions to our presenter. You may also text us with us through the chat panel if you have comments or need of technical assistance. A copy of the slides may be found on the Alliant Health Solutions website and a link to that site will be posted in chat in a bit. Next slide, please. This is the territory that Alliant covers. There are seven states here. Next slide, please. My name is Tanya Vidala. I am the category one lead for Alliant. We cover behavioral health and opioid topics. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce Melissa Lassiter. She'll be speaking for us today and I'll be turning it over to her. Thank you all for attending today. We do have a training in front of us. It will be a jam-packed hour for us to get this training in. Um, my name is Melissa Lassiter. I'm a BSN RN and my title with the state with the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services is the Regional Overdose Prevention Specialist. Now know that I specifically cover Region 6 North of Northwest Tennessee. So that's the upward nine counties in the far left-hand corner. There are persons just like myself across the state, and we will have that map um, and opportunity for you to see that at the conclusion of this training. These are our objectives that we have to go over uh, during the course of this training. So we will be discussing key terms. Most medical professionals should know what these key terms are, but we do discuss those at a very basic level so that when we discuss this with the public. Review overdose trends in Tennessee and our local community. I do have local data sets if you would like more information about your local county outreach. For the sake of time, I will not be covering all 95 counties in the state of Tennessee. Discuss the science of addiction, understand stigma and harm reduction. Recognize the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose and a stimulant overdose. That is new added materials since the 2019 revamp and again the new 2020, uh, 2020 revamp um, and the continuation thereafter. So learn how to respond to an overdose in response with naloxone or Narcan. Understand compassion, fatigue, burnout, and self-care, and then how to take actions in your local county and communities to be involved. So key terms, like I said, being in the medical community you may be more aware of these in the more depthful definitions, but very superficially, opioids are a medication or a drug that bind to the opioid receptors in the brain. They do include prescription and illicit substances. So prescription medications, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and some illicit substances like heroin and fentanyl. Stimulants are medications and drugs that cause increased activity in the body. So that increased alertness or energy. Some prescription medications would be Adderall or Ritalin and illicit substances like methamphetamine and cocaine. And then a basic definition for an overdose is when a toxic amount of a drug or combination of drugs overwhelms the body. So this is what our trends in the state of Tennessee continue to trend like. We're going to see some actual data sets on the next upcoming slides. But Tennessee continues to face an epidemic of substance use, and we know that these trends to, in 1990 and 2000 and then the continuation with the transition to synthetic opioids like fentanyl and tramadol were become more uh, on the front runners. Data points, um, they're defined at the bottom, prescription, heroin, fentanyl, and stimulants. And then this follows our fatal overdoses in Tennessee from 2012 to 2020. This one is specifically pointing out the fentanyl, I mean, I'm sorry, prescription opioids trends from 2012 to 2017 were the primary cause of death in Tennessee. Deaths due to prescription opioids declined from 2016 to 2019, while illicit substances like heroin and fentanyl become front runners. And we had a dramatic increase of fentanyl deaths. I missed a data point. In 2020, we had two out of three overdoses involving fentanyl, and that's what that point out is in 2020. In, 20, in Tennessee, in 2020, we had 3,032 Tennesseans die from a drug overdose. 
that does represent a 45% increase in one calendar year. It is important to note that when we, that little starred sentence there, it is important to note that when we add these totals up that are right above that, that they are not going to total that 3,032 Tennesseans because one individual can fall into each, uh, multiple categories. A couple things that I want to point out there is that 2014 deaths involve fentanyl. That's an 85% increase from the one year of 2019 to 2020. We also know that our data points by the Tennessee.gov overdose data dashboard usually falls about 18 months behind. As you'll see this heat map at the bottom, it's county level data and it shows the heat map uh, in relation to per rate. Rate is 100,000 population to be able to have an accurate count. So some of our areas may not be able to have the most accurate count in relation to county level data because we don't have that population. So you'll notice I specifically point out that I work in Northwest Tennessee. So that's the Lake County, Crockett County, that upper nine counties, uh, Benton County, Carroll County, all those counties up there. And two of our hospitals do not have a, um, two of our counties do not have a hospital. So their data points will be skewed. So it's important to know geographically and then medically what's available to be able to help that individual in case that overdose does occur. So off of data points, again, if you want more information about county level information, please reach out to us. We'll be glad to help. And again, I'll have that ropes map at the end. But addiction is a treatable chronic medical condition involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, environment, and life experiences. I'm an ER nurse by trade, and we point out pretty obviously that that heart is forever changed. Um, just like cardiovascular disease, that does damage our heart. Addiction does damage our brain, and it makes it difficult to function as it should. But those brain and that heart create new pathways with the right therapies in place to help that person find recovery from both situations. The science of addiction in relation to the dopamine response. Dopamine is a, a very intriguing chemical to me. I think it's amazing how our brain absorbs and uses that as our pleasure and reward. So addiction has been found in numerous root causes. One of the potential causes is that dopamine response. And dopamine is that neurotransmitter in the brain that plays a role in how we feel pleasure. So those pleasure responses. So when the substance is consumed, there is a fast increase in the amount of dopamine that's released, creating that satisfaction in that person's reward center in their brain, making that person feel pleasure. And then when the substance is consumed repeatedly, the brain begins to require a higher amount of dopamine to achieve the same feeling. So that's when we start talking about tolerance, where a person may decide to use more, having that same pleasure response. And at the same time, that substance makes the body less able to produce the dopamine naturally, leading to lows when the individual does not use that substance. Again, dopamine is such an intriguing thing. If you want more information about that, we can dive, definitely dive deeper on that for you. We do talk about adverse childhood experiences, and if you have not been through an adverse childhood experience, I do encourage you to do that. That is a pretty lengthy training. I am an adverse childhood experience trainer, and I would love to be able to give you more information about that. But adverse childhood experiences do include those things that are listed on the screen. They do affect our brain's development. I think if we don't discuss some data points on that, then we're missing the curb. So 61% of adults have at least one adverse childhood experience and 16% have four or more. So let's define what the adverse childhood experience is besides just those correlated experiences there on the screen. It is a current 10 question questionnaire that helps us understand what that child has walked through in their lifetime. The higher score, the greater potential to have health outcomes that are not desired. So where the individual may have obesity, depression, substance use disorder, so the higher score towards 10, the lower score towards zero has the potential better outcome of not having the greater risk for those substance or uh, depression, anxiety, obesity, other health care conditions. Some risk factors, we know that genetics play a role and family history play a role, but we also, our science is still cont continuing to study that, to try to identify that vulnerable part of our DNA and RNA, those sequencing in us to help us understand more about it and how it genetically affects us. But a family history of substance use and misuse does increase that person's vulnerability to substance use disorder. Other factors, co-occurring mental health condition. So 
39% of individuals with substance use disorder also have a co-occurring um, mental health condition. They share those overlapping common vulnerabilities and someone who has a mental health condition can lead to self-medicating that mental health condition and lead to further continuation and even a substance use disorder. So substance use disorder, some of those general diagnoses that we hear often in substance use disorder is alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, or illicit use, substance use, and then mental health conditions, anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADD, ADHD, bipolar, and or schizophrenia. Community level factors play a huge part in this and in enhancing that person's potential outcome. So community level factors can increase or decrease vulnerability for substance use. Education, does that person have access to education and or quality education or higher education? Community stability, do they have workforce development? Do they have the ability to maintain or gain employment? Social community context, does that person have the ability to have that networking? Are there groups and alliances or whatever the case may be so that that person can get involved to be a voice for their local community? Neighboring neighborhoods, uh, built environments, those are a huge part in my opinion, especially with our lower socioeconomic division individual. Do they have the ability to go outside and play even without the financial investment? Can we have that built environment where they can get out and walk or exercise or get their kids out of the house? And then access to health care. Again, going back to very rural West Tennessee where I'm at, we only have one hospital in each county and their um, access to higher level of care is not even in our region. We have to uh, sublet that out to other counties like Madison County, Nashville, Knoxville, Memphis, outside of our outside of our Northwest Tennessee area. So some stigma points that I like to point out is substance use does fall on a continuum. That person may be completely abstinent or at a point where they're using less or that person may have a chronic dependence on that substance. Relapse is not equal or moral failure. It is a chemical response in the brain, that desire, that dopamine release, sending that person back toward that pleasure response potentially. 40 to 60% will have at least one relapse and we need to set up those safety nets and uh, catch nets to, to keep that person from having that happen to them and be aware that it potentially can. Other chronic diseases, 50 to 70% with high blood pressure will experience symptoms every year that require medical attention. Be aware of your unintentional personal biases. So understanding that, again, where you believe or where your belief lies on that person on there, is it a moral failure? Is it not a moral failure? Also recognize that you need to check your on your own ability to help that person. Are you ready to be that person's help? Because if you're not and you don't have the right tools, then you may be causing harm. So we want to understand your unintentional biases, know um, where you stand on helping someone. Recognize addiction is often connected to trauma. That goes back to adverse childhood experiences that we mentioned earlier. And what potentially may have led that person to be in the substance use disorder that they are. Now, this is where I uh, work with our law enforcement a lot and our medical community a lot, and I help encourage us to change our verbiage, our language around substance use disorder. I'm not going to call somebody an addict. They're not. We, we I mean, we want to, to embed help and hope, not helplessness and hopelessness. So experiencing stigma can reduce that person's willingness to even seek help or take action to reduce harm you, to reduce harm or ask for help. That asking for help can be a blocked by you just saying, hey, addict or junkie, those type words are so helpless and hopelessness and we want to embed help and hope. Stigma among our medical and social services reduces the quality of care. If you're using this terminology, I do encourage you to change your terminology so that we can be a better asset to that person that's sitting in front of us and just acknowledging them as a person first, it helps them even ask for the help that they truly need. So say stuff like, Person with substance use disorder, positive or ne negative toxicology, sterile used or contaminated syringes, not uh, using substances, and then person living in recovery. We don't want to call someone an addict or a junkie. Clean or dirty. Um, I like to point this out with our law enforcement. They hear this a lot. Clean or dirty in relation to drug screens or in uh, relation to those needles. A clean needle can be that someone washed it in the sink with Dawn dishwasher detergent. That's not sterile. So we definitely need to work, watch our terminology and when in relation to that, those two things specifically, and then not ex addict. We always want to look for the recovery as a better term for that. 
This is my favorite slide on the entire training because this is something that I get quoted often. Harm reduction is a way of preventing disease, promoting health, and meeting people where they are. We meet people where they are in their substance use, ready or not, um, to get help. We meet people where they are if it's their family member struggling with substance use. We meet people where they are if it's law enforcement getting trained so that they could meet people in the overdose when they do respond, the fire departments, first responders, we meet people where they are. And when I say that, I even usually joke in that I will meet people where they are. I've been down back roads that are gravel roads to, to train that individual so that they could potentially save a life. So we do meet people where they are. And that's uh, it's 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 a breath of fresh air to be able to help someone to, to gain more knowledge over their substance use to help them find the path to treatment recovery. Again, not know, and knowing that not everyone is ready or able to stop. There are scientific ways to provide ways for decreasing that risk. So we do, are we going to talk about medication assisted treatment, naloxone, and then syringe service programs on this training as well. Harm reduction core principles, we are going to meet people where they are, but we are going to focus in, on enhancing that quality of life. Understand that behavioral change is incremental. Someone who has a substance use disorder is not going to stop cold turkey oftentimes because they're fearfully driven by withdrawals. Complex social factors do influence vulnerability to substance use, so that person may have poverty, social inequality, or trauma. And then again, empower those who have who do use substances to be the primary agent in reduction of their own substance use. Man, oh man, can I not tell you how many times giving that person more power over their substance use becomes that readiness step that they needed to be able to step into the path to treatment and recovery. Medication assisted treatment options. In the clinical environment, they are um, very proven with support and sustained recovery. Common medications listed there on the left, buprenorphine, methadone, subloxone, um, sublocade, sub uh, Vivitrol. That increases that person's ability for survival because they're taking a milligrammed medication for them, whereas an illicit substance may not be dose equated, a milligram equivalent for them. It also helps them increase their retention and treatment, so their ability to get that treatment for medication, their cognitive behavioral therapy as well, maybe even group meetings, AANA, celebrate recovery. The ability to gain and maintain employment, that one's huge. It decreases the illicit substances, again, that's not milligram equivalent, criminal activity, and then decreases their risk for contracting an HIV or viral hepatitis. So SSPs are the acronym, they're syringe service programs. They're community level health programs. They do offer sterile injectable equipment, testing for HIV, hepatitis, STIs, and a link to treatment, referrals to treatments for medical, social services, education and tools for overdose prevention and safer substance use. Again, that's where we train and distribute naloxone. Key point to note here is that these SSPs cannot not have one of these components. They have to offer all of these components or they cannot operate. They are backed by the Department of Health. So again, they have to have that all or nothing, they have to offer all of these service components that are listed there on the first part. SSPs do reduce substance use over time. People who inject drugs are five times more likely to enter treatment for substance use disorder when participating in an SSP. That's huge because we know that from the state level and from the national level and other countries as well, that the opposite of addiction is connection, is where we make that connection to treatment and referrals, connection to others who have been through these walks. And oftentimes when the person is participating in an SSP, they are encountering the same person. So they're more likely to enter treatment. So it's an amazing opportunity to get that person when they're ready into those next steps. SSPs reduce needle stick injuries among our first responders by providing the proper disposal. Um, they provide a safe place for the disposal of the used or contaminated syringes. That reduces our public places and like parks and parking lots to have those syringes being disposed of there out in the public where young children can even be contaminated. Reduce HIV and hepatitis incidents and even overdose deaths. This is a map about um, SSP programs across our state of Tennessee. They were legalized in 2017. They are being operated in 12 different locations and five different organizations across our state. If you have your phone open right now and want to take a, um, if hold your camera open, not take your take your camera open and uh, click on the link that pops up from that QR code up on the top right hand side to get more information about the SSPs. But again, they are backed by the Department of Health and that is a requirement to be open in the state of Tennessee. 
So what is an overdose? An overdose is an, um, when a toxic amount of drugs or substances overwhelms the body. They can look different based on the substance that is involved. We do know that overdoses happen with prescription medications, over-the-counter medi over medications, and illicit substances. And overdose deaths are preventable with the right tools, and we are going to talk about Narcan or Naloxone in a few slides as well to get us more equipped to save that life. So how do we save a life? No risk factors, recognizing the signs and symptoms of the different overdoses, opioids and stimulants, and then how to respond. Some of the risk factors specific for an opioid overdose are mixing substances, so illicit prescriptions or illicit, subs illicit substances and prescription medications, mixing opioids with alcohol, opioids and benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are your Valium, Xanax, and Ativan and also opioids mixing with stimulants. One of the things I like to point out about the next box there is that period of no use. Our internal organs are no longer tolerant to the dose we used to take if we go through that period of recovery, sobriety. So that person through jail, detox, rehab, that person's no, internal organs are no longer tolerant. So when that relapse happens, or if that relapse happens, that person's internal organs are no longer tolerant to that once dose, or they are definitely at a greater risk for an overdose. Counterfeit pills are happening and or unknown substances are happening in our, our country and our state. History of substance misuse, history of a mental health condition, a chronic illness, thoughts of self-harm, suicide, buprenorphine, methadone. It actually says it on the package insert that when not taken correctly, it can cause an overdose to happen. Using while alone or a previous history of an overdose. So opioid, again, the de basic definition, we usually revisit that for our general public. Opioid is a term for a drug or a term for the medication, the drug that is a re opioid that binds to the opioid receptor in the brain. It does regulate our breathing, our ability to breathe, and it binds to that receptor in our brain, like the picture shows on the right-hand side, much stronger. It binds to that site strong, very strong. So when too many occupy that site, the breathing can slow or stop. Some common medications are listed here on the left-hand side, and it also lists illicit substances. So um, the parentheses are the medications by trade name, and on the left-hand side are the generic names for those. Notice that, again, illicit substances are listed. Over on the right-hand side are street names or street terms for those substances. We do need to pause for a moment and talk about what fentanyl is and its um, lethality around that. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, meaning that it is not naturally occurring. And back visiting our data points from a few slides back at the beginning, two out of three fatal overdoses in Tennessee did involve fentanyl. Fentanyl is a 50 times more potent than heroin. And then carfentanil is 4,000 times as potent as heroin or 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Let's look at this picture really define. Um, that is not a beaker. That is a test tube in size and relation. So 0 0.5 cc's is the average dose, dose, dose of to be called lethal for the average adult person. Fentanyl on the far right is a very small amount in that test tube. Again, not a beaker, it's a test tube, so it's a very small amount. And then carfentanil, see how potent it is, a very, very small amount is even visible in that container. Again, not a beaker, it's a test tube size. 0 0.5 cc's is the average dose of the lethality for um, heroin. It's also important to note that individuals may consume fentanyl intentionally or without knowing, so intentionally or unintentionally. Fentanyl has been found in counterfeit pills, illicit substances, and even in illicit stimulants. Fentanyl is an opioid. Fentanyl overdoses can be reversed with naloxone. And an overdose involving fentanyl may occur faster than other opioids and may require more doses of naloxone for successful reversal. Some signs and symptoms that we need to be aware of and watch for are that person that may go into an overdose, that person that still is responsive, but they are going to have some signs and symptoms that they may go into the overdose. So very tight pinpoint pupils, nodding in and out of it, slurred speech, slowed speech, and they may scratch a lot. Signs that the overdose has occurred, that person has lost consciousness to that outside stimulus. Breathing is very slow, shallow, erratic, or has stopped. Choking sounds, gargling sounds, 
vomiting. You can vomit while you're unconscious. The body is very limp. Face is very pale or clammy. Fingernails and lips turn blue or purple. And then the heart rate will start to slow, be erratic or undetectable. Let's move on to stimulants. Stimulants are a group of drugs that result in increased activity. So that alertness, heart rate, or energy that increase in those does again include prescription and illicit substances. Over on the left hand side would be your prescription medications or illicit substances by name. Over on the right hand side would be some street names or street terms for those substances. Stimulants can have many effects on the body, including physical and psychological responses. Overstimulation, or we often call it overamping. And that's when an overdose is occurring with a stimulant overdose. Stimulant overdoses occur and can lead to some physical symptoms, some severe physical symptoms like heart attack, stroke, or seizure, and some mental health events such as extreme panic, paranoia, hallucination, psychosis. Stimulant overdoses can occur regardless of how much or how little you use or how long you have been using. It's very dependent on the person and the substances involved. I try to spend a little time with our public on that one. Oh, I say a little, I meant a little bit more time than I am getting to spend today because them understanding that it can happen with just one time is very key to knowing that that person can end up in an overdose in relation to a stimulant and in relation to any substance. So some risk factors specific to stimulants, the risk factors involving being awake too long, that sleep deprivation, dehydration, uncomfortable environment, that peer pressure, mixing substances, unknown substances, again, that's very risky, uh, not eating enough, company that makes them feel unsafe or already having an irregular heart rate. No matter the reason, it is dangerous and scary to feel overstimulated. Some of the physical symptoms with the overdose in relation to a stimulant, physical symptoms may be nausea, vomiting, passing out, chest pains, irregular breathing, convulsions, limb jerking or rigidity, tremors, feeling paralyzed while they're awake. So they may look at you and you are looking at them and speaking to them, but they're not able to interact with you. So they almost seem like they're trapped inside. That unable to sleep, rapidly increasing temperature or fever in very large pupils. So there are people, the color of their eyes, barely even visible. Some psychological symptoms, they may have the extreme anxiety, panic, paranoia, hallucination, agitation, irritability, aggressiveness, or even hyper awareness of their surroundings. Overdoses involving multiple substances. So when multiple substances are involved, it's hard for someone to know when a person is having an overdose, especially if they're in an overdose with relation to an opioid and there's also stimulants on board. In Tennessee, overdoses involving multiple substances are common. The signs and symptoms may look different based on substances involved. But the key point here is that I like to definitely say this after I read this next statement. If an opioid or fentanyl can be involved, you should try using the locks on. So if the person is giving you the signs and symptoms of an overdose, they're unresponsive, unconscious, not breathing, um, heart rate starting to slow, blue fingers and lips, you should try to use naloxone, and my statement that I was going to reference is, is you should try or they ultimately will die. You should always try to save that person's use, uh, their, save that person's life by using naloxone. And in Tennessee, roughly one out of three fatal overdose deaths in 2020 involved both an opioid and a stimulant. So this is where I want you to tune up your ears, and we are going to definitely roll through how we use naloxone, what we need to do as far as safety net wise to protect yourself and that person. So assess the situation. Is this person responsive? Can they communicate? And then assess your personal safety. Do you feel safe approaching this person without endangering yourself? Always ask those questions before you even move forward. Fentanyl poisoning overdoses um, by someone responding to an overdose are very rare. Where there's a lot of information out in the public about fentanyl exposure and you can immediately die. There is truth to that, but there's also some falseness to that in the fact that there has to be some break in the skin. Fentanyl does not easily absorb through the skin unless there is a break in the skin. And it is not in the air by normal. It's unless it's it's not going to be in the air unless it's intentionally put there. So let's say for instance, you haven't dusted dust your office desk or your TV stand in a month. 
there is going to be dust on that. And it's fairly stable on top of whatever it's on right now. But if I go up there and brush my hand across it, it becomes airborne. It's unstable. Same goes with fentanyl. If it's sitting on a container, on a counter, it's relatively stable unless it is intentionally thrown into the air. So we like to make sure we point that out so that um, when we hear those things, we can dig a little deeper and find out why or how that person was exposed. Was there a break in the skin? Was it intentionally put into the air? Naloxone can be safely administered in the presence of fentanyl with basic precautions. Always use gloves. If gloves are available, wear them, use them. Any barrier is better than no barrier. When you do have that exposure, wash your hands with soap and water. Do not use hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer opens the pores in your hands, make it more easy for that fentanyl or any substance to be absorbed. Do not eat, drink, touch your face, smoke, chew gum, any of those things before washing your hands if you've had a potential exposure. And definitely do not let fear stop you from saving a life. What we don't want to do though, um, in relation before we even show you how to use naloxone, these are things that we do not want to try. We do not want to put the individual in a cold bath or shower, they could drown. We do not want to inject the person with any substance, salt, water, milk, food, it does not work, it can cause an infection. Do not try to make the person vomit or give them something to eat or drink, they're gonna choke. They're not in control of their airway. You can't expect them to be if you put something in their mouth. Do not give over-the-counter drugs, no dose or niacin. Those are cardiac stimulants, so they're going to make that heart work harder. They don't help. It doesn't help at all. The heart is needing the oxygen. Do not hurt the person trying to wake them up, so don't. that doesn't work. It can cause an injury, so we're not going to kick someone to try to arouse them to do that stimulation. So we have talked a little bit vaguely about what naloxone is, but this is where we talk about what it is and how it works. So administering naloxone is the only successful way to reverse an opioid overdose. It does have a much more powerful attachment to that site than the opioid. So it does temporarily knock the opioid off so that breathing can be reinstated and restored. Now know that that temporarily window is 30 to 90 minutes. Now, also um, we are gonna take a, a quick quiz at the end of this. It's a very quick quiz. We're gonna do it collectively. So um, we, I do encourage you to, at that point we will talk or we can you can put it in the chat box but know that anything red bold or underlined you have been fair warned that it might be testable data so naloxone results in a person temporarily going into withdrawals we're going to talk about what that looks like toward the end of this training and it is not possible to overdose on naloxone by classification is a reversal drug an agonist to an antagonist or an antidote Naloxone restores breathing, but other symptoms caused by the stimulant may not be affected by the naloxone and need to be treated by medical professionals. So it's always key that if you suspect an overdose of any sort that you get 911 in route. So always call 911 if you suspect an overdose. These are the four common versions of naloxone, Narcan nasal spray and Cloxado. Next, Narcan is 4 milligrams nasal spray. And if a second dose is needed, you'll use the opposite nostril. We're going to go through how to use that one specifically on the upcoming slides. Clexado is an eight milligram nasal spray. It is right now um, in Tennessee, more prevalent in the metropolitan areas of Shelby, Memphis, and Knox County. Intramuscular injection is given in the outer thigh. It's the biggest muscle from the moment of birth to the moment of death, least likely to hit bone and to be absorbed in the correct manner in that muscle. So it is an intramuscular injection. So far we've discussed intranasal and intramuscle. There is another intranasal version that has the atomizer. You can tell from the look of that, that assembly is required. You have to put that thing together. Um, if you're a medical person, you may know how to already put that together. And if you are not, and you would like further training on that, I can definitely give you more information about how to assemble that one. But it's very, it's not hard to use, but it's um, if you don't use it, Mentel, if you don't use that, then you're not going to remember how to use that when the time comes. So if you don't use it, you lose that ability to remember that recall to use that substance, reversal substance. Um, the intramuscular injection, Avazio or Enzo, depending on which part of this country you come from, it is an auto injector. It walks you through the entire process. It is no longer manufactured, but we do see other companies coming on the forefront to want to do that again. Um, it is very much needed, especially with our elderly population, because it walks you through the entire process. 
So this is the actual steps on how we are responding to an overdose. You want to maintain that person's responsiveness. If they are responsive, you want to keep them talking to you. Obviously, we want to keep them talking to you because if they're talking, they're breathing. And we know that the lungs are operating. So we want to make sure that if they are responsive, keep them talking to you while you get 911 in route. So try to maintain that person's responsiveness. Call the person, shake the person gently using that sternal rub. Key point is that you make that fist and you use the space between the first and second knuckle, not your knuckles. This space here, not your knuckles. Um, and firmly rub on the person's chest to wake that person up. If the person doesn't respond, we move on to step two. We administer some form of naloxone. This is the one we are training specifically on is Narcan. So you're going to open the package as the picture shows. You're going to place your two fingers on the side of the, uh, the nozzle and then you're going to put the nozzle into the person's nose until your fingers touch their nose. And then you're going to firmly push that plunger to release the dose into the person's nose. Do not prime this device. It is a single dose and cannot be reused. Again, if a second dose is needed, you're going to swap nostrils and you're going to wait that two to three minutes apart to deliver that second dose. During that time, steps two and three are the only ones that can be done interchangeably, depending on the rapidness of how fast you can get them done. So either giving Narcan or calling 911, but 911 is going to ask you where you are. They're going to encourage you to stay with that person. So stay with that person until 911 arrives. They're going to ask you where you are, if that person is breathing or not. If, they've, if you've given naloxone, if you have it, if you know how, and then what substance the person took. They're asking those questions thinking about what step four looks like for you, and also in preparation for when that EMS personnel arrive. Step four, administer chest compressions or CPR, but you should only do so if you are CPR certified or instructed by 911. Again, going back to that last step, step three, they just asked you what that substance was. They may be telling you not to do the rescue breath, so you may be doing the chest compression only, and that is standard of care if you're going to be at risk for a potential overdose for yourself. So chest compressions only. Again, be advised that you should be listening to 911 or if you are CPR certified. At that point, when the person does start responding, it's pretty quickly usually when the person starts responding, and they if they do not immediately set up and start talking to you, and they're slow to respond, you want to put them in the sideline position so that if they do vomit, they do not inhale that vomit. It comes out of them. So sideline position with their leg up and their hand under their head, kind of like the sleepy position so that that person's vomit can come out and they're still well supported and you can observe them. So you can see that their lungs are still breathing. Step six, stay with the individual and observe the individual. They're going to have no memory of the overdose occurring. Comfort them. Um, they're going to be having those withdrawal symptoms. Help them to remain calm. Discourage them from using more opioids for at least two hours. They're going to have those withdrawals, so they're going to want to take more, but again, discourage them from using more because the naloxone is there first. Continued opioid use will not help with their withdrawal symptoms. Do encourage the person to get treatment from the paramedics. The paramedics or EMS can definitely help them from going back into a secondary overdose, and they can also help treat those withdrawal symptoms. When EMS arrives, tell them what you've done, what you've seen. So tell them, hey, I've given naloxone. How many? Did you give them two doses, three doses, one dose? And if you know the substance, be honest. Don't make accusations. Be honest. This is what I know, and this is what I know, and that's it. All right. Responding to an overdose, naloxone can last 30 to 90 minutes, opioids can stay in the person's system for hours. That person can go back into a secondary overdose, especially if the individual um, takes more opioids to counter those withdrawal symptoms. <clears throat> the withdrawal symptoms for that person when in the, re um, the reversal drug has been used, can't that person can be violent and erratic. Obviously, we want to make sure your safety is, 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 is we've discussed that. We want to make sure that your safety is on the forefront of your mind. If they're going to beat you up, get to a safe distance, but definitely stay where the EMS or whomever shows up can get information from you so that you can help that person. That person may project on vomit. They may have a cardiovascular event. That is not from the Narcan itself. That is from a pre-existing condition and or long-standing substance use. We know that long-standing substance use affects our entire organs. 
So um, our heart has not been beating as it should. So it is already slower heart rate. When it comes back to beating as it should, it may literally scream for help. It needs that oxygen and it may have a cardiovascular event. Obviously, if the person is taking an opioid for pain, that person's going to have musculoskeletal pain. All right. After an overdose, we often want to discuss, what about me? What about those rights and your rights and that person's rights experiencing that overdose? We're going to talk about Good Samaritan law here, and then we're going to definitely discuss your mental health and how does this impact you. So Addiction Tendencies Addiction Treatment Act that was passed many years ago that allows for the use of naloxone for someone experiencing an opioid overdose. Any person seeking medical attention for themselves or someone else after an overdose has immunity from prosecution for a drug violation on the person's drug first drug overdose. What does that mean in English? That helps to get that person the opportunity to stand in front of someone if there is any charges, period. That gives them the opportunity to stand in front of that judge and that judge offer them treatment and recovery options instead of it going on their permanent record. So there's safety nets to, to help that person make the decision in place. The Good Samaritan Act allows any person who has received this basic instruction, this basic training, you will have a certificate of completion and I'll have uh, Tanya email that out at the end and then to administer a locks on in good faith to a person experiencing an opioid overdose. If you want more information about that, I do encourage you to go on to the TN.gov website and look up the Tennessee Good Samaritan Law specifically related to naloxone. It's out there. Um, it has been continued. Governoral signatures continued many, many years in place now. So what about you? That compassion fatigue and burnout. Compassion fatigue starts very quickly and it's experiencing signs and symptoms of trauma that didn't happen to you. Now, I will tell you, being a, an RN and working in the emergency department for many years and still loving that, if we do not deal with compassion fatigue, we will end up in burnout. <clears throat> it's not an if kind of question. It's a will. It, you will. It's a when is it going to happen? It's that cumulative process that grows over time that just continues to grow. That cumulative process of that emotional exhaustion associated with workload or stress. No, we also understand that it is not just limited to the people in the helping profession. Substance use affects the family, friends, and loved ones. So that person may be experiencing that compassion fatigue, and if they don't get the help they need, they can end up in burnout where that family member doesn't get the support and help that they need long term. So this is where I plug that I hope we can get our families and friends into Al-Anon. That's something that we definitely need to help plug people into is Al-Anon to get them the the or grief group or whatever the case may be, it can be very specific and individualized to get that person the help that they need, not just the person that has experienced an overdose. <laughs> Some signs and symptoms of those mental and emotional symptoms can look like reduced sense of pleasure or accomplishment or meaning in your work, reduced productivity. Are you one that's usually on top of your game and all of a sudden you're not so productive? Maybe that self isolation. Are you an extrovert and you become an introvert? And are you scratchy sandpaper? Are you irritable all of a sudden? Something's different about you. Something's going on. We oftentimes are very defensive when someone starts talking to us about these type of symptoms, and we need to be more acceptive and have those open conversations about it when someone sees something different about something, about us. What I like to say here is if we see something, say something. I'd rather have somebody to be defensive and upset and then them go home and self-reflect on why did that person think that about me? and them actually get the help that they need. Physical symptoms, that exhaustion or physical or emotional difficulty sleeping, those stomach aches, headaches, digestive issues, or even chronic pain, it's not something that's not normal. What we can do about it, ways we can take action, get those healthy routines, eat well, sleep well, exercise, take that time to process things, journal, meditate, set healthy boundaries, I'm a yes person. I point that out about myself. If somebody asks me to do this, yes, I will be glad to. Yes, I'll be glad to. Let me serve you. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay to say no sometimes. Set those healthy boundaries in place. Know when you do need to say no so that you can take those breaks, take that time off, get that time away. Have those understandings about yourself. Recognize that about yourself. Nurture your whole self, including your hobbies, your relationships, and your spirituality. Avoid things like working longer or harder, 
neglecting your personal needs or interests, self-medicating, falling into a habit of complaining to your colleagues or coworkers. All right, we're gonna jump right into the quick assessment because I know we're cutting it close on time. So we're gonna jump right into the quick assessment. Um, and if you don't mind unmuting or participating in the chat box, we're gonna quickly go through these and I will give us the answers because again, it's collective. What forms of naloxone are available? We know that there is an intranasal. We know that there is an intranasal version. Ah, look at you, Miss Julie. Thank you for that. It is C. There is a nasal version, an intramuscular version, so it is C. Thank you, guys. Number two, more than one dose of naloxone may be necessary before EMS arrives. True or false? True. Good job, guys. It is very true. If a second dose is needed, I like to point that out again here. If a second dose is needed, you need to wait two to three minutes apart and opposite nostril. Should you give naloxone and leave the person alone? So you should, the question reads, you should give naloxone and leave the person alone. True or false? It is very false. We do not want to leave that person alone. We want to make sure that we stay within range, but of course, with our safety issue, uh, we, if we have anybody that's wanting to hurt us, we want to get to that safe distance so that we can be available to answer any questions needed. When administering intramuscular naloxone, where is the best location to give that injection? Good job. It is B, that outer thigh, it's the biggest muscle from the moment of birth to the moment of death, at least likely to hit bone and the biggest muscle to absorb in. How long does it last? This one was red, bold, and underlined several times. A is the correct answer. Good job, guys. Naloxone is an addictive substance. True or false? That one might be tricky. It is B. It's false. I mentioned it on the bo very bottom of one of those slides. It is an antidote, a reversal drug, or an agonist to an antagonist. It's fighting for that site, but it is much stronger. It's going to sit there for a period of time. Number seven, how do you determine someone's in an overdose? Good job, it is F. It is all of the above. Call 911 as soon as you suspect an overdose. True or false? Good job. It is true. Chest compressions or CPR may be necessary. Good job, that is true. And what law protects you from civil liability when administering naloxone to someone you suspect is overdosing? B, Good Samaritan law. All right, just a couple more slides to tidy up this conclusion, and then I will hand it back over to our host. And I have to say thank you for allowing me to present. So in Tennessee, you can go directly to a pharmacist without a prescription and obtain naloxone. Most people don't know that, but you can. You can go directly to a pharmacy without a prescription and get Narcan. Most insurances do cover it. They are a uh, cost range between zero and one hundred fifty dollars, depending on your insurance. It can be low cost or no cost, depending on which insurance you have. But TenCare can offer two units per person per month, and those HSA's health savings accounts um, offer the to cover those copays as well. If you are not insured, you can go directly to the um, Cover RX to get that, and you can go to the pharmacy with. If you have a prescription with that, it'll help you cover the cost. The pharmacies like mom and dad pharmacies, like mom and pop pharmacies, local pharmacies don't carry as much of it because of the shelf life. So your major pharmacies carry more of it. You can get it through the mail. The program that I'm coming to you today from is called Tea and Save a Life. And we do prioritize naloxone distribution for those at higher risk, their family members, and who may encounter someone who may need to save someone's life using naloxone. This is one of the data points that I do value that we save to the end because our current data shows that we have saved 26,000 lives. We reversed more than 26,000 lives in Tennessee. So that's 26,000 lives that have had the opportunity to find treatment and recovery options. And we know that's conservative based on reporting. Reporting is easy, it is anonymous. You can use that link there at the bottom. If you contact one of your ropes and you get naloxone, we do encourage you to report that. It's anonymous. We do not track you we track data we want to know the date ethnicity male or female substance use did that person live and we want that person to live so much 
we know that if we don't report, grants like these do go away. Um, we know that we are saving lives, but if we don't report, then grants go away. Think about how many lives potentially could have been lost. Get involved with your community. We are closing in on that last, last objective, carry naloxone to prevent an overdose, lock up your prescription medications. Your prevention coalitions get involved with them. They have those lock boxes. Drop off your unused medications at a local um, police department, sheriff's department, pharmacy. They have those for proper disposal. We do not encourage flushing them anymore. That is not safe for our environment. Coalitions in your community help for you to do. Help raise awareness in your community. Schedule trainings like this. Get involved with your regional overdose prevention specialists. Know who they are. We can help train whomever at whatever aspect. Get involved with your adverse childhood experience trainers, suicide prevention, mental health first aid. Again, I've plugged the coalition a billion times now. Know where those drug-free prevention coalitions are. Know your treatment referral opportunities with the Tennessee Red Line. That number's going to pop up quite a bit at the end of this. Support those in your family and those around you that are in recovery or finding their recovery journey. Seek out support for yourself if you have a loved one using substances. Advocate for treatment and medical and mental health support services amongst your first your workplace. All right, so here is some sites and resources. So if, so if you are an information person, this is where you are. Again, go to the link that she's going to send you that has all of the um, these slides in there so you can have all of these emails and websites. But lock up your medications, that's count it, lock it, drop it, dispose of them through the drug take back offer, um, outreach. And then TennesseeTogether.gov, we have a lot of activities and events for you and your family and your local community level. Tennessee Redline, getting that person treatment and recovery, that is 24-7, 365. Crisis for mental health crises, again, 24-7, 365. Both of those have text options. TN Recover app, that's a great app or platform to get involved with so that um, you can have all of these resources in your hand, know your ropes, know your, that's again, ropes or regional overdose prevention specialists. We love our acronyms at the state. I apologize for that. Um, we love our acronyms, but regional overdose prevention specialists and your lifeliners can help plug in those persons to get treatment and recovery options. Now, this is where I need you to help me and she's gonna pop this in the chat box. I really would like it if you would take the time to fill out this post completion survey. This post completion survey is anonymous. It helps us give and you answer freely, openly, honestly. Did you like this training? Did you not like this training? What didn't you like about this training? It's going to ask you questions. Did you like the materials? Did you like me? Did I speak too fast? Be honest. That's fine. Um, I'm from Northwest Tennessee. We tend to talk fast and have a draw. Um, so again, there's that. But take that opportunity to do that. It helps the state understand what you want more out of these type trainings. I am still here for questions. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm going to pop over to her next few slides and then come back to this because I like to leave this slide open when we conclude. But the ropes map for the regional overdose prevention specialist is over on the left hand side for other regional overdose prevention specialists across our whole state. That is my specific contact information at the top. If you take that completion survey again, which is linked on the right hand bottom corner, I'm number 16, Melissa Lassiter. So again, I'm going to pop off of this and I'm going to let Tanya take back over. But at the very, very, very end, I'm going to pop this back up. And my resources. There's a ton of them and small print. All right, so does anyone have any questions for me specifically? I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. You may not be able to unmute yourself, so please, if you do have any questions or comments, enter those into the chat and I'll be happy to share those with Melissa. If you want Melissa, while well, people may be typing, I can go over those other um, okay. slides That's and then perfect. we can come That's back. Perfect. Yes, thank you, Tanya. So here are our is our CMS scope of work goals. As you can see, behavioral health and opioid misuse are present along with patient safety, chronic disease management, quality of care, transitions, and nursing home quality. Next slide, please. Here's the contact information for Jovan Givens and Leanne Sauls, our two program directors. Please feel free to reach out to us. I'm available as well if you have any further questions. Alliant is here to assist you. 
Thank you again for everyone that joined us today. We know your time is precious these days, and we hope that you can join us for future events. Um, and I do want to say an extra special thank you to Melissa. I, I really enjoyed your presentation today. Um, it was a lot of information and it did go quickly, but it needed to. And I think all the important things really were, were, were touched upon. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much for you. presenting. You're welcome. I appreciate each of you for having me on today and just allowing me to have the opportunity to, per, per, to present on such a large platform for Alliant and um, I hope we continue to do more things together. I do appreciate you so much. I'm going to pop back over if that's okay, Tanya, to my Absolutely. Wife. So if anybody has any contact questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me and contact me. I'm here to help in any way that I can. We are great resources at the local level and other ropes across our state are as well. And we would love the opportunity to help partner with you to help your clients, family, friends, faith-based organizations, whatever the case may be. We want to help save a life, and that's why the grant is called what it is, Tennessee Save a Life. We want to help people meet people where they are and save their life. So, again, thank you so much for coming today, and I appreciate each and every one of you.